Hello, is this working? I think so, right? Yeah. Cool. All right, hey everybody, I hope you're doing well. Uh, I'm JW or Jan Willem Nijman, I'm 50% of Flambeer. Uh, welcome, just a warning, there's gonna be a lot of animated things that flash a lot in this presentation, so if that makes you nauseous or something like that, you can still leave now. And I'm, I think the next three minutes are safe, so don't worry. All right. So that's uh, Flambeer. <coughs> I never get how these things work. Like, oh yeah. So right now uh, I'm working on a game called Nuclear Throne. It's like a post-apocalyptic roguelike, like about mutants blowing things up um, and shooting and mutating. And it's a very hard game. It's uh, procedurally generated. So every time you play, it's different, and you'll die every single game. Um, it's on Steam Early Access now. If you want to check it out. So let's just get started. Usually when you learn about game, making games and all that stuff, people try to explain to you like, well, you can divide games into like neat categories. There's like art, design, and development, and then you can do one of these things and start making games, and you'll be great, and you can work in a team. And then a bit later, people maybe learn like, whoa, making games is way more complicated than that. You have like other bits of a pie chart, like marketing or, or community management or audio. Whoa, this is incredible. So to continue on that, this is what you call exploded view of something. This is an exploded view of a car. It's like a nice look at all the separate parts of a car. Um, you can see like, I don't know what car things are called, but there's like that thing, <laughs> this thing, I think that's a wheel. Um, but in reality, an exploded car looks more like this. Um, it's a mess, and there's lots of things there. And that's actually a lot closer to what games are like. Games look more like this pie chart. <coughs> Everything is like overlapping. There's a lot of shit in there that you don't even know what it is. Like, what's that brown stuff? I don't know. Um, Games, like every single thing in a game is kind of connected, and there's no real clear distinction. It's very hard to cut a game up into clear, easy to understand bits. And uh, frankly, I think it's not that useful to do that. So today we're going to take a close up at a tiny part of Nuclear Throne. This is the Nuclear Throne pie chart. I think we're going to be talking about like this little bit here, uh, and that's explosions. Um, which is fun because everybody loves explosions. They're a great way of getting people excited about a talk. So I'm just going to go over, I think it's like close to 20 different things. Just put a number on things. It makes it easier to understand. Um, and just talk about tiny little details in Nuclear Throne and try to uh, talk about how all the elements of making a game are involved there. It, it's about making games. It's not about design or programming or any of that shit, it's about just those little things. So this is the sprite sheet for explosions in the Cure Drone. It's, I think it's like eight frames or something like that. Um, and I'm just gonna jump right in. There's a cool trick you can do with explosions. The first two frames are just a, a white and a black circle. And if you do that, you get this super high contrast instantly for like, one moment in the game, and after that you play your nice animated sprite. All this is done by Paul Veer, by the way, our pixel artist. He's super great. Um, but yeah, this is what, we, what we're working with here. Um, and then there's sound. Sound is fucking important. Um, because a lot of people are, are very visual creatures. They think with their eyes, kind of. They see and they analyze that. And sound, they don't really notice it. It's just there. Um, that's why if you change the music, someone can get like sad or excited or um, all those beautiful emotions without really noticing like what's different. They're just like, oh man, this is sad. And that's because there's a violin playing, you know? Um, sound is really important. I'm not going to focus on that here because I'm not the audio guy. There was a talk this morning from Jonas. Um, but just imagine cool explosion sounds with all these animations because they really add a lot of weight. Um, there's another thing about our explosions. Um, well, this is the first time you're actually looking at something blowing up in the Cure Um But they, like, 
destroy things. That's what they do. And not just like enemies and stuff, but they also blow up walls and there's like stuff flying around. Um, and when we first added that wall destruction to the game, we were like, well, <laughs> that's a really good idea. And I have like one of those laptops, if you don't plug it in within like 30 seconds, it just shuts down completely. So this is kind of like timer looking through my bag, yeah, trying to find my charger. So I think we have like 10 seconds left now. This is probably the most exciting part in the talk now. So far. You really have to be a lot faster. We die. I wish there was like a button to make the screen go black. That would have been funny. Thanks, Diamond. Um, yeah, so when we, this is like a, a good example of like design and programming and all that overlapping. When we first added the destructible walls, we were like, you know, that's going to be fun for the gameplay because you can, I don't know, destroy cover and, and combat will be more dangerous or you can take shortcuts or, but in fact, it also just looks really cool and it feels great because suddenly like explosions are the only thing that destroy these walls and you're like, whoa, these must be really strong explosions. Even though in a lot of cases it doesn't really matter for the gameplay or the level design, just having it there is great. Um, so let's now take a close look at all the little animations and effects we have for our explosions. There's a, a, a lot of tiny different details in there. You can see that it's like the, the sprite playing that I showed, but there's also like dust and smoke. Um, dust is the, are those light little clouds that like shoot out, they disappear quickly, and dust is there to indicate movement, like there's a blast, so probably the sand on the ground like moves out. Um, and dust is also used when like something rolls or something moves fast. Then smoke is there to indicate fire, and it lasts a bit longer, and it kind of stays around, and I don't know, just like smoke does, you know? Uh, that's why, you know, when Call of Duty 2 came out, they had like all this big smoke and it stayed around really long and suddenly people were like, whoa, games are so real. Um, well, that's some of the tiny things the, the explosion does. And they're really simple, but they do a lot. And they also give you this sense of like, whoa, there was an explosion here because I still see that smoke and your brain can fill in the rest. Um, so this sprite sheet is the collision mask for the explosions. There's only collision on the, on the second frame of the animation. That's like another like programming trick to make it feel really powerful. Everything, all the damage happens in one instant. Like, poof, explosion does shit. Um, there's a reason this is on the second frame though and not on the first one like you think would be obvious. That's because it adds this really cool delay to explosions which looks more interesting and I'm sure it has like tiny consequences for the gameplay but it doesn't really matter. Like if I shoot two grenades and they blow, it's really dark, I don't know if you can see it but they don't blow up at the same time because when the first explosion goes it doesn't explode the next grenade until the second frame. So if you have like a bunch of explosive barrels or whatever standing in a row, they'll explode like this <laughs> instead of instantly um, and it just feels good. It's like a chain reaction type thing. And so that one frame collision doesn't only feel snappy because it's like instant, everything's dead at the same time, but it also kind of times stuff well. It's like choreography or something. Let's see. So then the collision size. Often when, like one of the first things I learned from uh, Cactus actually was like, hey, you should make explosions big because that looks good. and it's not hard to do. It's, a, it's pretty important that explosions look like big and feel powerful. Um, but often people learn about that and they do it and they add like lots of fire particles and stuff, but the collision for the explosion is still tiny. Um, it's better to go the other way around, have a tiny explosion. Well, don't have, have a big explosion, but for the sake of science, we're going to pretend you make a tiny explosion in your game, but give it a huge collision mask. Like When something blows up, there's like a big blast, a shock wave, that's what does the real damage. So if like something blows up in a game, have it like blow things, like these aren't touching, but it still destroys the cactus. Like I was a bit lazy, I could have tried aiming that grenade a bit further, it would have still destroyed the cactus, but that's like one of those tiny things where you like 
get that sense of blast more than there is visually to this and you know make it feel bigger than what it actually is like if you have a game with windows and something explodes make nearby windows you know break that stuff is cool um so then we watched at least i watched uh, um action movie from 92 called Free Jack with Mick Jagger who teleports a race driver to the future because he has a young body and he was about to crash and he can take over the body for his rich boss. It's a pretty decent movie. That's like some funny car chase. But they have really good like gasoline explosions um, and they leave like little flames behind on the ground and stuff and it's really important to get your inspiration from other media than just games or not even media, just life, like, go blow up a car and see what it looks like. Um, and we were like, whoa, why are we just having this tiny explosion? Why don't we leave, like, little flames on the ground? So that's what we did here, is, like, we added those big craters that are still going to get polished a little bit. And, what, this thing doesn't have flames. Let's find something with flames. Yeah, see? So when you blow up a bar barrel or a car, those flames stay around for, like, half a minute or something, probably way shorter, but it feels like half a minute. So next time you run back here after killing all these enemies, you still see those flames, and you're like, yeah, I did something here. It's like this sense of permanence in the world. You can see not only when you're doing something, but also that you've done something before. Uh, that's why corpses don't, expl don't disappear in this game, because there's a limited number of enemies and our computers can handle that shit. Oh yeah, this is a really cheap effect we did. There's like every single glowy thing, like lasers, bullets, explosions, they draw themselves at like 20% alpha with an additive blend layer on top. It's a really cheap effect, but it makes them look shiny and glowy and good, and we don't have to put any work into it. And it also like makes the explosions look slightly bigger. You see like that little glow layer maybe, like that reaches up to there. I don't know, just a stupid little trick we used. Feel free to try it as well. Let's see. Oh yeah, this is probably not a word. I think the real world is volume, but whatever. Um, but we started having bigger and bigger explosions in the game when we started adding more powerful um, weaponry and bosses that explode, which is really fun because the first time you destroy that boss, you're really happy and then you die because it explodes. Um, spoilers. But explosions push each other away. So if you have like 10 tiny explosions on top of each other, it becomes a big explosion. Um, that was like not hard to do, but adding little reactive systems like that can have weird consequences where like if you shoot a grenade into a car, you get a bigger car explosion than just blowing up a car. Um, and that that's fun. Like That also influences the gameplay. You get weird little dynamic things going. Um, just again, this is not really like, you should do this in your game. It's more like, hey, I'm going to talk about a bunch of things we did, and who knows, maybe it sounds smart. Uh, oh, debris. When you blow up a wall in the Cure Throne, like, it sends out little chunks of that one, and they have like dust because they're moving, and they stay around for a while. Because there used to be a wall there, like where does that mass go? Like this is all, not that I care about the science or anything, but it's more like, hey, let's add that, and it looks cool. And then I got thinking like, hey, maybe the debris damages small enemies, and you can do cool things like blow up a thin wall, and then enemies on the other side get hit by the debris and die. And I literally have never been able to use that in Nuclear Drone, but it does happen maybe, who knows. Um, and it's a cool idea, you know, like, yeah, I'm gonna blow this wall before you can see me and you get a rock in your face and then you maybe die. Uh, so, yeah, that's debris. It looks cool. Um, and it's different from just blowing up and something w without a wall near it, you know? It, it gets this sense of whatever. So, then we had all these explosions we were looking at and we are like, well, you know, it all kind of looks the same. You have this grid of big explosions and they push each other away. Let's add tiny ones to mix up the thing. So this one is bigger than those and they deal slightly less damage. I don't know why, probably because they're smaller and that changes the gameplay as well. And they push each explosion slightly less and they just make the shapes more interesting. Um, 
just saying, I guess. <laughs> then we added a bunch of more uh, explosion types, like toxic explosions and plasma and blood explosions. They all have like slightly different gameplay properties, like the police explosions, they destroy projectiles, and the toxic ones, they like spawn toxic, which kills everything. Uh, but it turns frogs into super frogs, and it's like, that's just gameplay stuff that kind of dynamically grew out of this. It was fun. Blood explosions don't damage the player. Um, it's like when you blow up a corpse with your mind or something. Uh, then we added cars, which new players in Nuclear Throne hate, because when a level is finished, the portal also has a blast, which destroys any props and stuff, and that blows up cars. And a lot of time, people like finally manage to beat that difficult area, and they get killed by the exit to the level, and they hate us. <laughs> and cars uh, have a lot more health than a health bar uh, an explosive barrel, so they, you get this tension, like, oh, when it's going to blow, I shot it a few times. Like, can I move next to it, or will it probably kill me? Well, it probably will kill you. Um, but cars are fun to blow up. That's a lesson. So add impact on things, because those explosions, like, they damage enemies. That's, like, the reason you want explosions, right? Um, have them fly really far when they die because they just got hit by an explosion. What do you think is going to happen? Then also, game design trick. If you have like barrels in your game that used to be an explosive barrel and your game is procedurally generated, always spawn a bunch of enemies with your barrel. So whenever you find a barrel in Nuclear Throne, there's like three bandits spawning next to it. So when you see the barrel in the level, you can instantly blow up three bandits because why else should... We have barrels, you know? This is how real procedural game design happens. There's no fancy mathematics. There's just cheap hacks, at least when I make them. <laughs> then there's the classic screen shake. Everybody knows that stuff. If something happens, shake your screen. That's a cool glitch. I left it in. Uh, also, there's this thing we do that the game kind of pauses when something gets damaged or explodes. A lot of people think it's lag because they only play Call of Duty, but I like it. So um, we did add an option to reduce the screen shake because it apparently makes some people physically ill. So, you know, be honest about your stuff and be like, yeah, I want you to play the game with screen shake. But if it makes someone physically ill, you should be nice to them and give them an option to turn it off. Oh, and that's the end already. Perfect timing. So those are all the cool people that worked on Nuclear Throne and Donald Trump because he's really funny on Twitter. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, also, my takeaway, you should be nice to people. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs>